Hi everyone, and welcome to this month's Wildlife Wednesday Roundup. I'm Tenley Thompson. And I'm Tyler Greenlee. And we've got some amazing videos to show you mm -hmm. from all over the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem this month. The way this is going to work is we're going to show you all the latest and greatest in wildlife sightings found by our team. Then you'll have a chance to win our trivia question of the month, and we'll have a question and answer session, Ask a Naturalist, at the end. Let's get started with everybody's favorite, our bear roundup. Check in how everybody's favorite grizzly bears and black bears are doing. As the summer draws to a close, berry production begins to ramp up in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. During this time, our sightings of bears become more and more abundant as these animals begin to move out of the high country down into the lowlands. In the lowlands, we have large amounts of service berries, huckleberry, thimbleberry, and other species of berries that the bears are wanting to utilize. Up until this point, the bears have been at higher altitudes trying to find army cutworm moths and pine nuts, which are their primary foods late in the summer, around the time of July and August. Now, we do have two different types of bear species in Grand Teton in Yellowstone National Park. We have the American black bear and we have the grizzly bear. Seen here is a female black bear with her cub. And uh, here's a, another video of them actually swimming in one of the many lakes we have here in Grand Teton National Park. Black bears tend to live in more forested areas. These black bears were seen in a pretty forested area next to this lake feeding on those berries that I just mentioned. Grizzlies are often going to be seen in more open country. This is how the two species manage to live within the same landscape. They actually partition the habitat and they partition based off of their diet. The black bears are feeding more on insects and more on leafy vegetation within the forest, while the grizzly bears, they're taking advantage of those higher protein those more sporadic events such as the army cutworm moths gathering under the boulders at high elevations, and then also the white bark pine nuts. Black bears are seen in the lowlands pretty much throughout the summer. They don't go up high into the altitude as much as the grizzlies. The grizzlies, however, are pretty difficult to see in the middle of the summer as they are, they are taking advantage of those high altitude banquets. Now, one bear that we do see, one grizzly bear that we do see in the lowlands quite often because she actually doesn't go up into the mountains is Grizzly Bear 399. She actually will spend a good portion of the summer months down in the lowlands feeding on food that isn't as nutritional or doesn't have as high of protein content. Now, the reason she does that is she's trying to avoid conflict with other bears. Uh, but she does pay, pay the price because the food down in the lowlands are is not as rich as up in the highlands, especially when it begins to get dry and hot down here in the lowlands. Now, that behavior is particularly interesting to me because at one point, grizzly bears lived across many different types of habitats. Currently in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, they do utilize the high mountains, but historically they lived out on the Great Plains. And that's really fascinating to me because those really rich food sources like army cutworm moths and white bark pine are not available out on the grasslands. And so I'm curious how these bears managed to survive in an area that was a lot hotter and a lot drier than the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And, you know, that's something we might never truly know. We might never truly know what food sources those bears fed upon historically out in the grasslands. At this time of year, however, those high altitude food sources are beginning to run dry and we're beginning to see bears move lower and lower into the valleys where you might see bison and elk and wolves, for example. And so we're going to be seeing some different behavior in the coming months. These bears, they're going to feed a lot more on berries. They're going to start feeding on roots. You know, the vegetation, it's going to start turning yellow and orange and drying up. That means there's not going to be as rich a food down here for the bears. And so they're going to be feeding more on roots. They're going to be more dependent on carcasses. And it's going to be an interesting couple of months here in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. Thank you so much, Laura and Sarah Ernst, for shooting that great bear image. 
I mean, especially the one where that grizzly bear is crossing the stream. Like, yeah. what an amazing thing to see on tour. Awesome, guys. So up next, we have Laura talking about antler growth. Uh, she has some really exciting things to, to say about antlers and actually has kind of a unique little skit for you guys. So here we go. Oh, hey, it's Laura. I spent all summer long growing this great big rack of antlers. What do you think? I hope you like them. <laughs> all members of my family, the cerevid or deer family, grow antlers in the summer. Usually it's just the bucks that get to grow antlers, but I'm a special case. I wanted to show off. So what do you think? <laughs> You're my nar. <laughs> so I started growing these amazing antlers at the end of last winter. My old antlers were getting a little heavy and I didn't need them because winter's not mating season for deer. So I just dropped them off on the ground. One day they just kind of got loose. They started to wobble a bit and then they just fell off. And all I was left was a little wound on my head, which is called the pedicle, where the antler had shed. It bled a little bit, but that cleared up pretty fast. And then pretty soon after the, the forage started to get really good, like the, the food that was growing in the woods got really tasty, really nutrient rich, I started to grow little nubs. They were just tiny little nubs at first. Um, the inside of the, the nub was made out of bone and the exterior was covered in a thin fuzzy skin called velvet. Velvet brought nutrients to my antlers so that they could grow really fast at a rate of about a quarter inch per day for me because I'm a mule deer. But for our other deer species, that could mean up to two thirds to a full inch per day. For a really big bull moose, that could mean he's adding a pound to an antler each and every day during the peak of the summer. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have to carry those really big, heavy moose antlers around, and mine look pretty good, so no worries. <laughs> Growing this nice set of antlers didn't come easy. Over the summer, I put a lot of hard work and preparation into growing such a nice set. I had to find the perfect place to live I found the spot with the best soil, the best vegetation, the most water, a lot of rain up there in the mountains. Uh, I looked for the plants rich in phosphorus and calcium, as well as sodium and other trace minerals that I needed. And I can thank my parents for such great genetics. Thank you. Some of the other hoof mammals or ungulates that live nearby, like bison or bighorn sheep, mountain goats or cows grow things that are called horns on their head, which are different from my antlers. Horns are made from keratin, just like my hair or my fingernails, whereas of course my antlers are made out of bone. Horns are usually kept for life, with the exception of the pronghorn, which you know, shed their horn sheath each and every year, but typically animals with horns will maintain the same horns for their entire lifetime. Those horns just get bigger as they grow up. But for, for deer, around here, mule deer, white-tailed deer, elk, and moose, we shed our antlers each and every winter to regrow a new, bigger, better set for the next summer. In late summer or early fall, antlered animals will rub or scrape against trees or bushes, the ground, or hopefully not you or your car. <laughs> to get rid of the annoying velvet that's coming off of their antlers. Over the summer, that, that velvet housed a system of blood vessels, but as the, the days get shorter, the blood circulation to the antler tissue cuts and the, the velvet starts to come off in long strands, which must be really annoying. <laughs> and it also corresponds with the time when his testosterone levels are making the jump from zero to a thousand. So he starts to get mad at pretty much everything that moves or doesn't. <laughs> He's going to shine up his antlers to look really handsome for the mating season. And his antlers are going to calcify or harden so that um, they're very durable during a sparring match. All of this energy invested and all the antler growth is for one very special time of the year called the rut or mating season, which happens every fall. 
And that's when bulls or bucks get together to spar with one another to see who's the best, the biggest, the baddest bully around. <laughs> Females are pretty picky. They're interested in not only the most symmetrical buck or bull, but of course the one with the largest antlers. And he's gotta be the most competitive in battle <laughs> to show that he's the most vigorous and the best choice to, to pass on his genes to the fawns of that doe or cow. <laughs> so what it comes down to is this is a really big popularity contest, but way more important, way more life and death than who gets the vote for student council president at school. <laughs> it's all in an effort to produce the healthiest offspring, the healthiest fawns or calves during the best season, during that springtime green up in May or early June. Well, thanks guys for swinging by to learn more about my antlers. Next year, I think I'm gonna go back to just being a regular doe. So next time you see me, I might not have these big, heavy, awkward things on my head, <laughs> but it's been fun and I'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, Laura, for that great look at antlers. One of the really fun things to see as we get into the fall in this ecosystem is all the great antler activity going on all around. All right, let's get back to predators because who doesn't like predators? And we haven't so really cool. gotten a good look at wolves yet today. We had just a crazy situation happen in Yellowstone that we've been keeping an eye on with a bison and the wolves who came afterward. Let's check in. It is the bison rut here in Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Park. And all across the lowland valleys, great herds of bison have gathered together to challenge each other and for the males to start tending and fighting each other for the females. The bison do several different behaviors when or during the rut, including roaring demonstrated by this bull. These bison are all challenging each other. They're full of testosterone. They are rolling in the dirt and trying to intimidate each other. Inevitably, fights break out. And sometimes these fights can lead to injury or even death in some bison. Uh, bison weigh 2,000 pounds. They can easily move a vehicle. And so, you know, injury from bison fighting each other is actually pretty common and the predators are here to take advantage. And last week I was able to film and witness some wolves actually scavenging from a bison that was killed during the rut. Now the wolves scavenging from this kill are the Junction Butte Pack. One of the members of the Junction Butte pack that we actually witnessed scavenging from the bison kills was this wolf called uh, 1276. Uh, you can see she is radio colored, uh, but she wasn't the only wolf we saw coming in and scavenging from this bison kill. We also saw several yearlings. This is a yearling wolf here. You can tell from the longer hairs on the nape of this wolf. The Junction Butte Pack is one of the largest wolves ever recorded within Yellowstone, and recently over 30 of them were seen altogether traveling along the northern range of Yellowstone. Uh, this means that they need quite a bit of food, and especially with eight growing pups, they're going to need a constant supply of nutrition and food for those growing animals. And so a bison, especially a bison that they did not have to kill, is a very valuable source of food for these wolves. And so they are readily going to take advantage of this kill. They will likely feed upon the carcass for several days, as long as, as, long as another carnivore doesn't come in and steal it. Now, during the sighting, and look, this is, this is actually a video of 1276 again, and she's chewing on the bison hide. Now, actually, Later on in the week, we weren't there to film it, but bears did come down and investigate this carcass. Uh, but the junctions were able to hold on to it and utilize it as a food source 
for several days after the bison died. Now, during this sighting, the majority of the wolves that we saw were black. A large portion of the wolves in the Junction Butte pack are actually black in coloration. The alpha female is currently black, and that is a dominant trait, and so the wolves tend to be black in this pack. Now, we did have one gray wolf, this wolf, who's a female. Her, her collar is, uh, or her ID number is 1228. She did come down and feed on the carcass as well. But a really amazing sighting and really, really thankful that we were able to see these wolves in action. Awesome, guys. Really great footage of those bison and wolves. It's really cool to see that interaction during the breeding season when those bulls are actually clashing together. And then, you know, if the bulls get injured, the predators reap the rewards. And at that particular sighting, I believe they had wolves, grizzly bears, coyotes and foxes plus numerous scavenging birds coming in and feeding on that that bison and so you know, it is sad when these bison you know they do clash and uh get injured but if they die they do feed the entire ecosystem so their death is not to waste awesome guys we're going to check out another herbivore we have sarah ernst uh this evening talking about mountain goats Hello, wildlife watchers. This is Sarah Ernst with Eco Tours, and I'm here at Busy Mammoth Hot Springs with a little bit of some uh, travertine terraces behind me, a little bit of spring water, and then in the background behind me, <laughs> just popped up, is Bunsen Peak, and Bunsen Peak, an extinct volcano core, is a habitat where we're seeing mountain goats expand to over the last few years. Mountain goats are a non-native species to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, as far as we can tell, based on the fossil record and the Native American uh, knowledge and the, the diaries of the beaver trappers and gold miners in this area. They were introduced to nearby mountains in the 1950s and 60s, and now are found in both Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. Um, looking at the DNA of mountain goats, we think they may be more closely related to the muskox we have up in the Arctic, as well as the chamois over in Europe, than they are to the actual goats that we have as domestic animals here in the United States. Mountain goats follow a similar pattern to the other hooved animals here of giving birth in May and June when the uh, snow has melted and the young plants are at their most young and uh, tender, easy to digest. And the females will give birth alone up on the mountain slopes. Later on though, we'll join um, larger herds, sometimes of just a few individuals, sometimes several dozen, and we'll raise their young together uh, during their brief mountain summers. The breeding season for mountain goats is in November, December, and typically they'll have one young and give birth um, every other year. They're not gonna necessarily give birth every year as most of the elk do. At EcoTours, mountain goats are a special treat for us to see as they're not normally seen from the ground in Grand Teton National Park and in Southern Yellowstone. Uh, we do see mountain goats sometimes in winter in the Snake River Canyon and we see them pretty frequently in Yellowstone when we are on multi-day trips as I am today uh, along the slopes of the Beartooth and Absorca Mountains. Although increasingly we've been finding them here um, in the Mammoth Hot Springs area on occasion too. We also have bighorn sheep here at Mammoth Hot Springs, both male and female. And the female sheep are often mistaken for mountain goats because they have slender uh, pointed horns similar in length to a mountain goat's one easy way to tell them apart though is the mountain goats are going to be a creamy white, think kind of polar bear white, and the bighorn sheep are going to be a light tan. Although sometimes they will bleach out in the sun and be pretty pale looking, but they won't be that snow white of a mountain goat. This is Sarah Ernst up at Mammoth Hot Springs for Eco Tour Adventures signing off. Thanks Sarah so much for talking to us about mountain goats. You know, Sarah was actually on a multi-day trip when she filmed that. And so I just want to thank her for taking the time to actually get us that information and to uh, send us some great 
interp on mountain goats. Yeah. Uh, she's one of our hardest working guides. So thank you, Sarah, so much. All right, up next we have Josh talking with us about a fence pole. Um, and if you don't know what a fence pole is, it's um, a conservation measure to remove fences, particularly in areas where wildlife migrate. And uh, we'll have Josh explain more about it. Hey everybody, Josh Metton here. Um, I'm out in Goosewing Creek uh, with the Jacksonville Wildlife Foundation scouting a, a fence pole. Um, really beautiful day out here in the Grovance. We just saw a large herd of pronghorn running right along the fence, fence line and um, standing right over some moose scat. And we've seen elk and mule deer scat. So a really, really important area for our wildlife. And this is an old fence that no longer need, is needed. And so we're going to try and pull down as much of it as possible, but there's several miles of fence. So really looking forward to getting this out and improving the habitat for wildlife. On Sunday, August 29th, Ecotour Ventures naturalist Sarah Ernst and Josh Metten joined a team of volunteers to remove barbed wire fencing in the Grovant Wilderness, east of Jackson Hole. Fencing can be very hazardous to wildlife, impeding movements and migrations, and in worst cases, leading to entrapment and death. That's why we're big supporters of the work of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation to remove unneeded fencing and where it is necessary, replace it with more wildlife friendly fencing. This project successfully removed about a half mile of fencing right in the middle of critical mule deer, elk, moose, grizzly bear, and wolf habitat. The fencing was also located within the path of the pronghorn migration corridor. For thousands of years, pronghorn from Grand Teton National Park have traveled over 100 miles along this now federally protected migration route to get to Winter Range near Pinedale, Wyoming. Sure enough, during the fence pull, we saw a group of over 20 pronghorn right near the fence that we removed. Want to help support the work of the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation? Consider donating now through September 17th via the Old Bills Fund Run. This annual fundraising event partially matches all donations thanks to generous co-challengers, making your money go further. Learn more at oldbills.org. Pretty neat to see uh, some of those fences come out of the ground, in some cases for the first time in more than a century. Uh, mm -hmm. Big thanks to Josh and also to Sarah Ernst, both of our guides who were present there at that fence pole, and Josh, of course, who set that up and created that fence pole, along with a partnership with the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation. So we have a big fundraiser out here in Jackson Hole every year. It's called Old Bill's Fun Run, but you don't have to mm -hmm. run to participate, <laughs> and you don't even have to live in Jackson Hole. All of our local nonprofits are members of this event, and the way it works is it's pretty cool. We've got some co-challengers in town, mostly anonymous, who will match any donations anybody make between now mm -hmm. and I think it's September 14th. So if you'd like to support some nice, cool local Jackson Hole conservation of uh, organizations and charities, you can go to oldbills.org. And the beauty is if you donate five bucks, for instance, to a local charity, it will be matched and it will be $10 that actually goes to that charity. So a really good time for local Jackson Hole giving. All right, so that was pretty great. Really fun to see some good things happening out there. I'm sure the pronghorn are gonna have an easier time migrating. But it is, of course, time for my second favorite part of the program, which is our trivia question of the month. Now, I have passed the torch of Quizmaster over to Tyler, because let's face it, he's oh better boy. at it. <laughs> he's way better at it than I ever was. Um, but I do, of course, want to explain a little bit about this broadcast and our trivia question. Um, we, of course, offer this program free of charge um, and are just happy to get you guys a little couch vacation to get a chance to see some of the wildlife exactly. out here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but of course, we do have an EcoTour web store, which mm -hmm. goes towards um, supporting our employees and staff and supporting their benefits, um, helping them directly. 100% of what you would spend at that web store will go to the guides who you see have created this program. So if you'd like to help us out, feel free to hop on our website and check out the web store. We do have a featured item of the week, which is really fun. These are our um, 
bear beanies created by our naturalist, Elise Tonelli, um, who hand makes these. And actually, here she is uh, modeling, actually. Yeah, there she is. One of the hats. Yeah, so that's Elise. So if you'd like to have one of these of your very own, um, I do know that they've been selling briskly. So we only have certain colors left and mm -hmm. definitely available on the mm -hmm. website to check out. If otherwise you just would like to support us, um, as naturalists and support this program, we'll always accept donations. You can just go right on our web store page, go right to the donations page, throw us a couple bucks. That'll go straight towards everybody's benefits here um, at Eco Tour Adventures. We originally started this program in the middle of the COVID pandemic, actually, mm -hmm. um, when we weren't running tours as a way to help support guides and continue to have them be paid. It ended mm -hmm. up being really popular, and so we continue the program, but we still continue those benefits towards guides who create videos so that you guys can get a little piece of the greater listening ecosystem wherever you're joining us from. I've so enjoyed the comment section, seeing where everybody is joining us from uh, this particular month. Super, super fun. I'm a little curious to see who's going to be furthest away by the end of the broadcast. Oh, yeah. It's super. We, I mean, we've had people in crazy places like the UK before, like yeah. other countries. South Africa, Argentina. Yeah. So if you think you can beat everybody in terms of who's furthest away, do let us know in the comment section. But it is time for our trivia question of the month. So we'll start with last month's trivia question. But the way this is going to work is if you correctly answer this month's trivia question, yes. you'll be entered to win mm -hmm. a gift card to the Eco Tour Adventure store. Maybe you can pick up that beanie made by Elise if you want, or many of our other great products. We um, just added a couple brand new books on the Great Yellowstone Ecosystem. One of mm -hmm. my very favorites, the Yellowstone Atlas. It's a visual look at migration, um, wildlife density, land use, all the things you'd ever want to know if you want to be nerdy about the GYE. That book just got added. We're about to add Death in Yellowstone because we're going to have a Halloween Death in Yellowstone cool tour. Book. It's going to be I'm super so fun. And I'm so excited for those tours. They're yeah. going to be amazing. I know Death in Yellowstone sounds like <laughs> a super morbid book, and it is, but it's also a really fun book. And it's really, I mean, interesting <laughs> because it teaches you a lot about the history of Yellowstone. Yeah, so that's going to be up and coming. Lots of art prints, things made by guides, um, Teton pottery, all sorts of things. So definitely check that out. But in the meantime, all right, let's get to the fun part, which is the trivia question. <laughs> this is, first we're going to start with last month's question. We're going to get you an answer. Go ahead and answer in the comment section if you know the answer to the question, but we've already given out the gift card for this one. Yes. Then we're going to do this one's trivia question, and there's two parts. There is the first part, which gives you one chance to enter, and mm -hmm. then there's a bonus question for you smart Alex out there who tell us <laughs> our trivia questions are too easy, and that will also give you a chance to enter a second time and get two entries in for that gift card. All right, Tyler, take it away. All right, guys. So last week for trivia, we talked about stoneflies. And so if you don't know what stoneflies are, they're an interesting insect that actually lives in the rivers here in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, we have a couple different species. These are two species shown, a salmon fly and a golden stonefly. They live for quite a couple of years in the river and then they emerge. You can see here, you actually they have carapaces, which is their exoskeleton, which they crawl out of and then have um, wings in their adult form. And at this time, well, in July, so we're a little past the season, but in July, you can actually see large swarms of them flying up the rivers, mating, and then dropping their eggs. And they're a really important food source for many riparian migratory birds um, and a lot of fish. And they kind of correspond right after the cutthroat trout spawning season. And so, you know, those trout spend a ton of energy swimming up river, migrating to their spawning grounds, and then those females producing all of those eggs that takes a ton of calories. And so these stoneflies provide those fish with kind of a recovery food. And so we're always excited to see them on tour. Last week's trivia question, which in the comic sen section you can still answer, um, if, if you want to, uh, before I give away the answer, yeah. was um, how long do adult stoneflies live? So this isn't the entire life cycle. This is just once they emerge from the water, how long do adult stoneflies live? And then the bonus question was, what are the three main types of stoneflies we have in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? 
So if we didn't stump you with that second question, which I definitely did not know the answer to, <laughs> um, I can see defeat. If Don Meyer, if you're watching tonight, it, man, that's a tough one. Give us some yeah. credit. That was not an easy question. Um, and I'm so pleased that, you know, we don't do enough entomology in insects here in Wildlife Wednesday. Everybody likes the wolves and the bears yeah. and moose, and we do plenty mm -hmm. of that. But so much of what makes the Great Yellowstone ecosystem special is it's a complete ecosystem. And what I mean by that is everything that should be here is present from the smallest of insects to the largest of large predators. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most special places on the planet. And that's one of the only complete ecosystems on the planet. And that includes, of course, our stoneflies. We're a world-class fishing destination in part because of our diversity of stoneflies. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping that we have some fly fishermen in yeah. the audience tonight. And hopefully they can give a shot at the answer. I, my dad's a huge fisherman. so if My dad too. Yeah, so dad, if you're watching, give your answer. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see. All right, guys, so the answers for last week's or last month's trivia questions are, um, they are C, so three days. That's how long stoneflies actually live crazy. once they emerge from their exoskeleton in their adult form. The reason for that is because stoneflies actually don't have working mouth parts and really no food source once they emerge. And so their only purpose once they enter their adult, adult form is to mate and spread their eggs in, in the rivers mm -hmm. and streams. All right. And then for the bonus question, the answer was, um, it was A. So that is salmon flies, golden stoneflies, and green stoneflies. Those are the major groups of stoneflies we have out here. We also have a fourth group that's pretty rare, but they do occur here called the giant stoneflies. Oh, I've never seen one. They're carnivorous. Whoa. So most stoneflies, when they're larvae, they live under the rocks eating algae and plankton and other other microorganisms. Whoa. And then you have the giant stonefly, that's which is cool. carnivorous, and they eat caddisflies, mayflies, and other stoneflies. All right, so, add to my list of things yeah. that I need to see in my lifetime. Wolverines, yeah. <laughs> Canada lynx, giant stoneflies. Yeah. That would be very mm -hmm. cool. That's very cool. Yeah. Excellent. Another like mini top carnivore just under the rocks in the rivers. <laughs> yeah. cool. Speaking of uh, top carnivores, we have this week's trivia question. With this month's trivia question. Or just question. month's yes. trivia question. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, okay. We'll... Now remember, if you want to win, <laughs> you've got to answer in our comment section. If you're watching this on like another group's page, you've just got to click on our logo, get to our comment section mm -hmm. and comment there. Um, cause we won't be able to see your comments otherwise. Exactly. And we'll choose one lucky, mm -hmm. um, correct answer to win. And then if you answer the bonus question correctly, you also get an extra additional entry just to make mm -hmm. things a little bit tougher. Awesome. Okay. So we're going to do this month's trivia question next. All right, here you guys go. So for this month, we're asking you guys about bears. And the first one is, how much land does an individual grizzly bear need in the greater Yellowstone area? And uh, to give you guys a little bit of a hint, we do see bears all over the landscape. Yep. And uh, particularly one bear, uh, 399, we see her actually travel the entire valley. Yeah. So. So uh, that's that's a hint. Awesome, guys. Our bonus question is, what are the major food items during August for bears in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? And so if you guys have a, a guess for those for those questions, uh, please let us know in the comment section and you'll be entered into uh, that raffle. Yeah, and if you got mm -hmm. all of those right, you should probably yeah, apply for a job with yeah, us. Right. Uh, very <laughs> tough. Thank you to our quiz master, Tyler, as, as always, for coming up with some really difficult ones, actually. Yeah. I had to think a little bit about the bonus question uh, before I came up with an answer with it mm -hmm. this month. So definitely. We had a one. whole moment where we, were, we yeah. were like discussing it among the guys. <laughs> yeah. He definitely <laughs> instigated a naturalist nerd debate yes. on that second question for sure. All right. So it's time, I think, for my favorite part of the program, which is we, Tyler and I, are here to answer mm -hmm. your questions live. So if you have a question for a naturalist um, or somebody in your household does, kids are certainly welcome with their questions as well. Um, although do let us know because sometimes our answers can get a little verbose and we want to make them age appropriate. Yes. But yeah. um, definitely just ask us in the comment section anything about the Great Yellowstone ecosystem, about North American wildlife, mm -hmm. about... 
ecology, okay. like anything about biology, yeah. you know, the natural world, we'll do our best to answer if we know, if we know the answer, which we yeah. know. And if we don't, yeah. we'll look it up, we'll find out, exactly. we'll let you know in the comment section. <laughs> that does happen. You guys can we stump us stumps. on occasion. <laughs> but the beauty is, I'm so happy I have Tyler with me now because everything... Um, that he knows that I don't know will definitely be to all of our advantage for sure. So if you've got a question, go ahead and ask us in the comment section. If you see us looking down, um, it's because we're looking at our iPad where we can actually see your questions pop up live. So we're not being rude. We're just checking through and we'll go in the order in which they were received. All right, everybody ready? Yeah, okay, let's, let's do, do it. This. Let's see what we've got here. Ooh, oh my gosh, so many trivia oh, answers. Yeah. And a lot of correct trivia answers, you smart cookies. Let's see here. Let's see here. Ooh, this is a good one. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yes, at this time of year, we're beginning to notice the cervids within the landscape actually beginning to lose their velvet. And so if you don't know what velvet is, it is the epidermal layer that grows on the outside of antlers when the bone is actually growing. So deer lose their antlers every single year and regrow, uh, regrow a new set. And only the males have antlers versus in bison and bighorn sheep, both the females and the males have ant or have horns. Yeah. That's the yeah. nature of antlers. Mm -hmm. Only male have them. Although, trivia question. Yeah. Name, name the only antlered animal in the world in which the females have antlers. Do you know? No, yeah, I do know. Do, do you know? guys know? Maybe let us know in the comment section. Yeah, so tell, yeah, yeah. maybe I'll address it at the end. Mm -hmm. But that velvet, <laughs> if you were to reach out and touch a moose, it's um, super soft. It's fuzzy. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's, it is like a skin. And when these animals are moving through their environment, they can actually sometimes injure their antlers. Yeah. It is delicate when it's growing. And sometimes you'll see moose or elk with like cuts or abrasions just from maybe they got spooked by something and they crashed through the undergrowth and nicked the, nicked the skin on their antlers sometimes. Yeah. And so it is pretty delicate. Um, eventually, at this time of year, those the, the skin, the velvet, does begin to die and dry off. And at that point, it's not going to hurt the animal anymore. And they begin to scrape it off on trees and sticks. I've read that the what they do first is they find the coniferous trees and they scrape their, their velvet off on the coniferous trees first. And it kind of dyes it mm -hmm. kind of like a brownish, yep. like pitch-like color. And then what the, the males will do is they'll go around and find deciduous trees so like cottonwoods and aspens and they'll polish the tips and make them nice and pearly white wow. and the females actually prefer males with polished antler tips well there you go mm -hmm. I, I love it polished antler tips are what's what's happening <laughs> in the animal in kingdom. the animal <laughs> antler world <Yeah. laughs> so all those lady elk out there that's what they're looking for peacock feathers psh, what, what those elk want, man. They want polished exactly. antler tips. Pretty exactly. cool. All right, All great shiny. question. Let's see here. What else we got here? Libby, we will go ahead and put that link up. I think you're thinking of one of two. One is Old Bills, O L D B I L L S dot org to donate to any of our conservation nonprofits here in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Mm -hmm. That goes until September 14th to have your donation doubled. And that's the Community Foundation of Jackson Hole that will take care of all of that, including transactions and everything else, mm -hmm. transaction fees, credit card fees, what have you. So 100% of your money doubled goes towards those nonprofits, mm -hmm. including the Jackson Hole Wildlife Foundation, who was uh, the, the organization that was working on that fence pole and does a lot of fence poles around uh, Jackson Hole. We do, as staff, we do a fence pull every year with them. We love to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but any other conservation nonprofit as well, you can get there. If you're looking to donate to um, the EcoTour Adventure staff and to uh, support them for all these videos that you got, um, you can go to jhecotouradventures.com and then just go to the shop section of that website and you can donate right there. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll try to get a link up for you in the comment section, make it super easy for both of those. But great question. Let's see here. Man, all these all these trivia question answers. There's definitely some debate, which There's, makes me yeah. feel better. We guys asked you maybe a little more of a stumper than I thought. That's always good. I'm seeing lots of right answers. 
Christine, this is a great question. Is the barbed wire repurposed? It depends a little bit on the condition of the mm -hmm. barbed wire and if there are people who'd like to use it. So Jackson Wildlife Foundation is certainly willing to do that for everything from art projects um, to all sorts of things, actually. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in having some of that barbed wire, contacting them is a great way to start. They have more than they know what to do with. If they can't find a use for the barbed wire or the barbed wire is in very poor condition, then that barbed wire will be recycled. Um, but they don't necessarily make a decision until they get out there, get a good look at the condition. Yeah, and you know, some of these fences have been out there for a very, yeah. very long time. And, and so the con And I've actually participated in the yearly fence poll that we do, and different sections of fence are in different conditions. Yeah. Some of it's definitely usable, and then some of it is definitely, like, twisted and gnarled, and it's even hard to, like, wrap it up in the wire bale. So, like, it, re it really does depend on the condition of the wire. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely, um, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle whenever possible. Um, some of this stuff, you know, was put up in the 80s and some of this was put up in, you know, 1915. Mm -hmm. So it just it depends a little bit on the condition out there. Uh, but great question. Thank you very much for that. Let's see here. Ooh, I'm seeing some right answers on the deer question. Let's see here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have a winner. So here we go. <laughs> Michael, you're so smart. <laughs> Female reindeer. So the question I was asking earlier, what is, so the nature of an antler is it's a bony projection from the head that branches or prongs and mm -hmm. only males have them. So anywhere in the world you go, if you see a bony projection from the head that branches out, right, it's going to be an antler and you'll be sure that the animal you're looking at is a male. The only exception to the rule mm -hmm. is reindeer. Yeah. Also Female known as a reindeer. Caribou. Yeah, caribou. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Caribou in North America. Yeah, I think we were talking over the Christmas season last year. I learned something new. There's like 27 different variations of reindeer There's and caribou. There's quite, quite a few, and they range in size. So like on on the Canadian archipelago, there's a type of rain or caribou called the Perry's mm -hmm. caribou. And they're super small. Yeah. They're kind of they're kind of dwarf caribou and they are almost pure white year round because they live so far north that summers are so short that it's better for them not to waste the energy yeah. changing their color to brown in the summer and for them just to be white year That's round. Crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. And then the caribou I think that most people are familiar with would be uh, the barren ground caribou, which are the ones that make the mass migrations, you know, millions of animals trekking thousands of miles across the Arctic tundra. Uh, you can see, see videos of caribou migrating from like planet earth yeah. Doc the documentary yeah great stuff mm -hmm. and just a side note because i just have fun with this every depiction i've ever seen of santa's reindeer they all have antlers yeah funny thing is male reindeer actually shed their antlers in november mm -hmm. and the females keep their antlers until early january which says to me from a <laughs> biological perspective that would imply that all of santa's reindeer are female rudolph was a male or female. Rudolph was maybe a girl. <laughs> Rudolph um, was maybe a girl. <laughs> however, who knows? Those animals are moving so fast yeah. during the Christmas season. Maybe they're just mistaking antlers. It's hard to say. It could be a mixed group. But I'm just saying mm -hmm. for the record, if you're wondering, maybe Santa's reindeer are female. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, if you're wondering, there's two types of bony projections that we commonly see from the head. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about... Um, like rhino horns now. I'm talking yeah. about horns and antlers. So a mm -hmm. horn, bony projection from the head, both males and females have them, and they don't branch or prong, right? They're one solid piece. Oftentimes they can be made of, of keratin, same stuff your mm -hmm. hair and fingernails are made out of. Antlers, bony projection in their head that does branch or prong. Only males have them, with the exception, of course, of reindeer. Exactly. Uh, and they're usually made of bone. So mm -hmm. if you want to be nerdy and know the difference between horns and antlers, anywhere in the world you go, that's going to be true. Pronghorn antelope are a story for another time. They're like their own class. They're, they're like, like a whole other thing. So <laughs> they're just. Biologists, They're bizarre in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. Biologists love to put things in boxes, and the pronghorn antelope just doesn't fit in any boxes. Box. And that includes the horn and antler box. So that's a story for another time. But great question. And there's a very specific reason why caribou females actually have horns in the winter. No. Yeah. They actually, usually it's pregnant females. Yeah. That have horns and they keep the horns oh. so that they can compete with the mate or the antlers, the antlers so that they yeah, sorry guys. myself antlers <laughs> they have antlers so that they can fend off the males when competing for like sparse food resources perfect Sweet. oh bill right next to this one is tenley have you spotted an eskimo oh curly my gosh. Yet? no <laughs> i haven't haven't uh for those of you guys wondering we do have long billed curlews here in the great yellowstone ecosystem 
Eskimo curlews, which are thought to be extinct, um, look really similar to the point where I'm not sure I could tell them apart. Mm -hmm. And I had an ornithology professor in college who told me that if there were still Eskimo curlews existent in the world, they would be in Grand Teton National Park. So I'm obsessed mm -hmm. with the idea that I'm somehow going to rediscover the Eskimo mm -hmm. curlew. <laughs> kind of looking more dim every year but so, it's gonna happen guys it's I, gonna happen i read about these birds actually a couple days ago yeah and their official status so if you go by the iucn red list status there's like endangered threatened critically endangered extinct in the wild they classify the eskimo curlew as critically endangered they don't oh, they don't say extinct. they don't say extinct oh interesting the u.s fish and wildlife service does mm -hmm. say extinct but um interestingly enough the international union um actually surpasses that in terms of authority so mm -hmm. all right maybe there's a chance guys and they live and nested in incredibly remote areas they nested on the arctic tundra yeah and the reason they went extinct was mainly because of hunting yeah and they were hunted mainly on migration they migrated in large flocks Kind of similar to the passenger pigeon and so they were easy to track and follow and to harvest large numbers of them yeah. they also nest in large colonies and so they're particularly susceptible to a population drop yeah. because if their population drops then their their reproductive success also drops um but they did nest in end winter in very remote areas um on the grasslands in argentina is where they winter and then the arctic tundra in canada in alaska is where they spent their summer. So yeah. who knows? But it's the time of year. Yeah, where, where if they were going to pass through Grand Teton, <laughs> they'd be here. Guys, I'll see if I can't get a picture, like a drawing of an Eskimo curlew, because of course we don't have a photograph. Yeah. And an image of a mm -hmm. long-billed curlew for you guys in the comment section, so you can compare for yourself and see um, if you'd be able to tell them apart. But it's yeah. going to happen. It's going to happen. I feel Nothing like of hope. With these, so we have a couple extinct birds in North America. We have the ivory-billed woodpecker, mm -hmm. Carolina parakeet. People keep claiming that they're seeing these birds. Nobody ever says they see a Labrador duck. Or a great auk. No, nobody's claiming <laughs> those, to see yeah. a great auk. <laughs> those we're like pretty sure are gone, but but the ivory-billed woodpecker and Caroline I feel like we're Pelican. missing one. Aren't there five species of birds? There's the he birds? hen. Oh, he, he hen. hen. Mm -hmm. Which I'm was so like I forgot about East it. Coast. I know. Heath hen. So Sorry, a heath, heath hen, hen, if you don't know what it is, it's very similar to a prairie chicken, which is like a grassland grouse and they do look a lot like a chicken yeah which is why they're named a prairie chicken <laughs> it's funny on the one hand it's so sad that these animals are likely gone forever um you know mm -hmm. ivy but woodpeckers are pretty awesome too so on cool. the other hand i find it actually i don't know if you were just to approach this isn't it remarkable considering the diversity of birds we have in north america that we only mm -hmm. have five extinct species there's probably more. And I think there's another one. No, am I missing There's a one? warbler, but I can't remember its name. Oh, no. Yes, recently extinct. Recently, mm -hmm. like 1982. It's really, Or yeah. 84, they declared really it recently. extinct. Oh, mm -hmm. gosh, I can't remember. I, I can't remember All its right, name. All right, Eco Tour guys, <laughs> if you are watching this live, please do comment in the comment section and tell us which warbler it is that has gone extinct. Um, yes. Charlotte Catalano, one of our great bird experts, although mm -hmm. Tyler is one too, is probably learning, oh my God, you guys, I can't right. believe you don't know uh, this. <laughs> yeah. um, so comment in the comment section, remind <laughs> us which warbler it is. Oh God, it's going to come to me in two seconds. I know. It's killing me. I can't All right. think of it. I can like picture what it looks like also in my it's head. It's coming to me. It's coming to me. <laughs> Uh, all right, let's see here. Oh, lots of reindeer answers. Awesome, guys. Um, Lynn, this is a great question. When, where are the antlers picked for the Jackson Town Square? Mm -hmm. Really good question. So the original antler arches were constructed in the 1950s by the Jackson Hole Boy Scouts. Um, so if you aren't familiar, the Jackson, Wyoming is in the southernmost part of Jackson Hole. And the National Elk Refuge is also in the southernmost part of Jackson Hole, the two um, but right next to each other. And elk traditionally have migrated to the southern end of the valley because it gets the least amount of snow uh, for about 100 miles in every direction. And so if you're going to dig under the snow to find food, mm -hmm. you want to go where there's the least amount of snow possible. Um, we can get up to 50 feet of snow in Yellowstone in the southern aspects in the winter. You're going to migrate or die. So the elk refuge then yeah. becomes mm -hmm. what you need to do. Um, the elk began to struggle early on in the last century, primarily because of overhunting, but also because we began to put a bunch of cattle out on the landscape who ate all of the grass that the mm -hmm. elk relied on all winter, but they ate it all summer. So the elk would show up to their winter range for the winter, the yeah, cattle had been no grazing food. on it, and they'd starve to death. Mm -hmm. um, so a supplemental feeding program was started and the National Elk Refuge was created to help these elk survive the winter. But starting in the 1950s, they started, um, they stopped feeding hay 
Which, long mm -hmm. story short, sort of side note, wasn't really very good for the elk. The elk can actually starve to death while eating hay. They yeah. need something that's higher in nu nutrition. They're not they're not built like a bison. A bison is like a powerhouse that breaks down like the cellulose, can yeah. actually extract nutrients and energy from like the driest yeah. of grass. Elk can't do that. Yeah, no. elk, need, elk need better food. And actually, the smaller the herbivore you go, the better food you need. Yeah. So, like, deer need even better food than elk do. Yeah. So, they're feeding hay because mm -hmm. they thought, well, that's what the cows are eating. We want to help out the elk. Mm -hmm. It was it was well meant. But um, one of the great naturalists of American history, Olas Muri, came to study this, actually, after studying the caribou in Alaska, so and realized that it was actually <laughs> causing necrotic stomatitis. These small scratches in their gums from the stiffer forage were causing these fatal infections. <laughs> they might have been doing more harm than good, yeah. feeding them hay. So, they went ahead and they switched. <laughs> to alfalfa, um, eventually to pelletized alfalfa, which kind of floats up on the snow and makes it a little easier for them. But mm -hmm. they had to start using modern tractors to distribute that kind of a food product. Mm -hmm. Well, they went out there to feed the elk and the tires ran over those antlers that had been building up oh, for a very, very long time mm -hmm. and popped Centuries. them. And so they needed to get the antlers off the landscape. Now, antlers do serve a purpose. They're an important mm -hmm. calcium source, particularly for rodents. Um, they enrich the soil as they decay. But the elk refuge realized at that point that they weren't going to be able to supplementally feed the elk by having all those antlers out there. So they needed mm -hmm. all the antlers to go, but they didn't have any money. So they needed a whole lot of free labor. So in the early 1950s, they talked the local Boy Scouts into going out on the National Elk Refuge and picking up the antlers every year that had been shed during the winter. And those antlers just kind of piled up in a pile outside the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service office in town because nobody really knew what to do with them. Yeah, and, and it was such a surplus. Yeah, like, I mean, it was like an unbelievable number of, antler. of yeah. antlers. Remember, when they originally were picking them up, antler can take a long time to decay. It does eventually. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> they were picking up some pretty gnarly antlers. And it's so dry here that we have trees that will fall over and then stay on the ground and not running away for like three, five decades yeah. sometimes, in some cases. Sure. And so those antlers could stay out there for a very, very long, very long time. time. <laughs> yeah. So eventually the local Elks Club helped the Boy Scouts erect the original antlers on the town square. Mm -hmm. And there were a couple things that happened, um, particularly as I was a child. Antler value began to skyrocket. Yes. Back in the 50s, antlers were worthless, but they slowly became more and more valuable, particularly for overseas trade, particularly to some of the Asiatic markets. And today they're really used widely for dog chews. Mm -hmm. As the antlers became more valuable, people began to take antlers out of the arches to have like a little souvenir to take home and of course as the antlers got older they began to break down right you yeah. light was breaking down the bones so they started mm -hmm. spraying them down with sort of this clear polyurethane every year to try to keep them going but eventually in about 2010 mm -hmm. they were just falling apart and they were falling apart because people were taking antlers out they weren't very well sort of it's stuck souvenir. in there <laughs> uh but they're also just dissolving so all four antlers arches the original ones on the square were auctioned off by um, by the Elks and by other organizations in town to raise the money to, d to construct new antler arches. The, all four antlers have since been, arches have been reconstructed. They're bigger than mm -hmm. they used to be. They have a steel superstructure and they're um, wired in. So you can't just... You can't just like take one. Yeah, you. because they're way too valuable now. Yeah. Um, if you think it's not uncommon for antlers to go for, what, $27 or so a pound during the antler auction, sometimes more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a big pair of antlers that could be Oh, almost 40 pounds of antler. Mm -hmm. So it could be a very valuable thing to just pull an antler out of the square. And actually, there's almost like a whole industry in Jackson mm -hmm. where at a, after May 1st, which is the legal time where you can go and collect antlers, people will go into the national forest, not the national park. You can't legally take anything from the national park. But in the national forest, people will go out and go at antler collecting and will gather as many pounds of antler as they can, and then they'll sell it. Yeah. Antler's pretty valuable stuff. I, I know some stuff. folks who go out and spend two weeks collecting antler, and they mm -hmm. don't have to work the rest of the year. They make enough money. They live frugally, but they don't have yeah. to work the rest of the year. So the modern-day antler <laughs> arches are constructed on the square out of modern antler that was collected from the National Elk Refuge. There is an antler auction every year during Old West days in the spring. However, this year it's going to be in the fall because mm -hmm. of COVID. It's coming up, I think, in like two weeks. Mm -hmm. And some soon. folks bought antler at auction and then donated it towards the antler arch project. Many mm -hmm. thousands of people contributed. And we have four brand new antler arches on the square. They're beautiful. However, trivia, <laughs> if you want to see one of the originals in Jackson Hole, you still can. The Rustic Inn did buy one of those original antler arches at the original auction. And they do have it near 
Um, they have it on their property, oh, just cool. as you're heading into Grand Teton National Park, kind of right near the pool. You know, I've always, I actually didn't know that. So oh, okay. I've always wondered because I obviously there's the four around the square. Yeah. But then almost every tour, I would drive past this one arch that yeah. was at the Rustic Inn. That's why it's there. And I was like, I just thought it was like a normal. I didn't yeah. realize it was the original. So. Well, I'm good on the Rustic because it's falling so I've, apart. I've learned something tonight. Yeah. Cool. I don't know how long the one at the Rustic's going to last. Yeah. It's falling apart. <laughs> but if you visit us in Jackson, go see those antlers. And please, when you see people on the square saying, oh my gosh, I can't believe they murdered all of those elk, <laughs> do remind the friendly folks uh, on the square, antlers are shed every year by the elk. Mm -hmm. um, 80% of the proceeds of the antler auction goes back to improving elk habitat, goes to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service on the elk refuge. The remaining 20% goes to the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of that is used just to hold the auction, put up the tents and get the auctioneer and all that stuff. However, they are the wealthiest Boy Scouts in the United yeah. States. They get to like go to Europe and stuff. That's it's awesome. very cool. So great question. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Bethany, she says, I want to know about the barbed wire. Why was it left behind? It, it wasn't. They took it. Um, we're not going to leave barbed wire out on the landscape. Um, those fence posts and that barbed wire was removed. Um, as for why was it there, it was originally land that was grazed by cattle, and then the Goose Wing Ranch decided that that was important wildlife habitat and gave permission for it to be removed. Mm -hmm. Great it wasn't stuff. probably utilized anymore. Mm -hmm. They probably weren't grazing cattle. And a lot of places in Grand Teton National Park historically they were owned as ranches and cattle were grazed in Grand Teton National Park. So we have a lot of old historic fences that are no longer being used, but it's, it takes a lot of manpower to actually remove a fence. And so instead of removing it, sometimes they're just left there until a nonprofit or the park service comes by and picks up those fences. Great question though. Let's see here. Libby, thank you for posting that oldbills.org. Certainly appreciate it. Let's see here. Don says, old, old wire looks good around barnwood frames. It looks great it around barn, bar, bar, uh, <laughs> barnwood frames. That's fantastic. Let's see here. Mark, this is a great question. Um, I just tuned in and wondered what fall festivities are planned for Jackson Hole and guests. Mark, we definitely are still having some of our great fall um, we're sort of famous for all our fall festivals here in Jackson mm -hmm. Hole. We are doing them very carefully. So yes. uh, probably the most famous would be the Fall Arts Festival. That is still going on, including the Quick Draw. Um, I don't. I think the Gallery Walk is also going on. If you go to the Jackson mm -hmm. Hole Chamber of Commerce website, they're the ones who put the Fall Arts Festival on. You'll get a full list of the events over the whole two-week period um, and get an idea of what's going on. But it's going to be a more socially distanced, masked up, more outdoor celebration than historically it has been. Mm -hmm. But the good news is that we are definitely still having Fall Arts Festival. I can't wait. One of my favorite times of year. Uh, I've actually, so I moved to Jackson during COVID, so I never got to experience yeah. it. Yeah. So I'm super excited it's about gonna be really all fun. the fall festivals. So stuff. definitely check that out. Like I said, our old West Day celebration, including the Antler Auction, has been moved to this fall. So we're actually going to have our spring celebration now in the fall. So you can mm -hmm. come out and see the Antler Auction, which is really fun. There's a whole lot more to the Antler Auction than antlers. Anything anybody finds out in the wilderness, uh, mm -hmm. you can set up a blanket on the town square and sell it. A couple years ago, I found um, this guy had a a tree log with like a big horn sheep horn like oh my god like stuck in it it was really really neat all sorts Whoa. of beautiful things um beautiful jewelry all sorts of just stunning stunning stuff um for those of you guys who don't know elk their third molar is actually made of ivory um and ivory jewelry is also an option there mm -hmm. for that so pretty cool we've um got a few yeah people's market is still going on farmers market is still going on including the big um, elementary school pumpkin sale is still, mm -hmm. I think, going to be a thing. Um, obviously, we're keeping an eye on things as the Delta variant surges. We want everybody to be safe. Some events that were planned are being postponed or being kind of downsized. Mm -hmm. Definitely the Chamber of Commerce website is your best friend on this for up-to-date information on, you know, as conditions change, what we're doing, what we're not doing. But definitely the wildlife is still out there. The wilderness is still out yeah. there. If you're planning to come and visit, you can come hang out with us. Come exactly. on and join, right? Definitely worth checking out. Elk and bears, yeah. and, you know, it's fall, bear season. Yeah, it's bear the season best is time of year to see them. Yes. So very cool. <laughs> Let's see here. Oh, Don, wow. Oh, whoa. That's amazing. That's crazy, Don. That's fantastic. All right, I think we have time for one quick question and then we've got to go. Um, oops, that, not that one. <laughs> there we go. What do you think, Tyler? Ooh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So typically what happens is in the spring, we stop seeing our great gray owls because they kind of disappear. They disperse across the landscape and they begin nesting. 
And also during the summer months, they uh, become more nocturnal. And so our sightings of great gray owls in the summer months go down. Now around this time of year, it begins to get cooler. And those owls, they, they're coming back to areas we often see them in the winter because they're done nesting. And so actually this time of year, we begin to start seeing great gray owls. And I'm super excited. I know Verlin recently saw some great gray owls on a Yellowstone tour. And yeah, I believe tis that the season. tis the season. Yeah. Yep, they're beginning to show up. And so um, I haven't seen any yet this year. I, last year, I saw one about mid-September was my first That's sighting. That's about right, yeah. That's about right, yeah. when, they, when they begin showing up. Yeah. Uh, if you guys don't know, uh, great gray owls, they do become more active in the winter when it becomes cooler. And you can actually see and track them in the snow. Mm -hmm. the, the, what they do is they dive with their little feet into the snow to catch voles and mice. And you can actually see those tracks and you can see their wing feathers in the snow That's where their right. wings left imprints of feathers. And that helps you find these owls. Now, when, when, whenever observing owls and other birds of prey, they tend to be pretty sensitive. Um, owls and eagles in particular tend to be, and golden eagles in particular, tend yeah. to be really sensitive to human disturbance. And so um, while it is really exciting to see these animals, we just want to make sure that we, uh, you know, stay far enough away that we're not disturbing them, especially if they're nesting. And so when we do see these owls and eagles and other birds of prey, we often use our optics. Yeah. Our scopes come really in handy, especially with the owls, because they tend to be more sedentary. They'll actually sit on a perch. Yeah. And then you can use that scope to zoom in on them and get like a really clear picture of their face. It's almost better than like walking up to them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, One of my mm -hmm. play, favorite play ways to see great gray owls this time of year is on top of power lines, mm -hmm. um, power poles. So as you're moving through the valley, you know, keep, keep an eye yeah. open, uh, particularly around dusk, looking up uh, and you'd be amazed. Mm -hmm. How many things we miss looking up? Yeah. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, like porcupines in the winter, they're almost always near the tops yeah. of trees. And I feel like if I just walked around like this, I see twice as many porcupines and owls as probably mm -hmm. I do, but I'm looking out, right? So great, great season for that. Um, That's interesting. But yeah, okay. I don't know. If, do we have time for another one? Let's see here. Um... Oh, gosh. I think that's all the time we have this time, guys. It's been such a pleasure spending this month with you, as always. We really enjoy it. I hope you've enjoyed the duo. Yeah. Big thanks to Tyler for putting together all the videos this month, which was a huge project. So much fun. I, I really do enjoy talking with you guys and producing those videos. It is a lot of fun. And a big <laughs> thanks to all of the Ecotour Adventures uh, uh, staff and guides and naturalists for um, taking the time to take some of these videos out in the field. If you've got any questions we didn't answer or somehow we missed, we'll definitely check them out in the comment section. Put some of those images up that I promised because everybody I know is fascinated by Eskimo curlers. Exactly. Uh, and yeah, anything else, if you're watching this a little later after it's been live, put your questions in that comment section. We'll get you an answer. Definitely. But uh, yeah, in the meantime, happy fall. It's yeah. such a wonderful time to be out here. We hope we see all of you one day. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the meantime, yeah, this is what we've got. We'll see you next month. Yeah, right? look up pictures of heath hens and, oh, yeah, heath and hens. female caribou. And female caribou. Yeah. There you go. There's your homework, everybody. Exactly. I hope you all have a wonderful <laughs> month. You have a wild upcoming weekend. Stay safe out there, and we'll see you next month. Yeah, see you in October. <laughs>